오늘 소개해드릴 어, 교수님은 어, 그 워싱턴 유니버시티 오브 워싱턴 CSC 알렌 스쿨 오브 CSC 어, 디파트먼트의 어, 어, 오세훈 교수님이시고요. 오늘 말씀하실 토픽은 디퍼렌셜 프라이버시와 뭐 로버스트 머스 어, 스타티스틱스에 관련된 강연을 해주시. 하겠습니다. 그리고 어, 그 오세영 교수님이 2019년에 워싱턴 대학을 유니버시티 워싱턴 대학에 교수님을 하셨고 2012년부터는 어, 일리노이 대학 산업공학과에서 교수 재직을 하셨습니다. 그리고 스탠포드에서 박사를 하시고 그다음에 MIT에서 포스닥 하셨고 굉장히 많은 상들을 받으셨습니다. 최근에는 어, 초반에 들으신 분들도 있겠지만 어, 그, 이런 디퍼런셜 프라이버시, 페더레이트 러닝, 그 다음에 로버스트 로버스트 에스티메이션 이런 쪽으로 많이 연구를 하고 계시다고 합니다. 자, 그러면 어, 우리 오세훈 교수님을 박스, 박수로 <웃음> 온라인이지만 맞이하겠습니다. 감사합니다. All right. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be invited to back to SNU, which is my home school, after so many years, and meet all of you. And this talk is not going to be that long in time, so feel free to stop me anywhere in between. Unmute yourself. I won't be able to check the chat, so just feel free to unmute and stop me and ask questions, and more questions is always welcome. So last couple of years, I've been thinking quite a bit about how differential privacy and robust statistics come together. Um, and in the first half of this talk, I'm going to give you the first uh, efficient algorithm that probably guarantees privacy and robustness. And then the, in the second half of this talk, I'm going to switch gears a bit and um, give you an inefficient, slow algorithm but which can be generically applied to any statistical estimation problem to characterize the fundamental statistical uh, complexity of the problem. So without further ado, let's get started. So this is joint work with my amazing collaborator, Xiang Liu is my student at UDAP. Uh, Wei Ao Kong is a former postdoc, uh, used to be at UDAP. And Sham Kakare is my former colleague who's now at um, Harvard. All right, so there are increasingly more and more scenarios where we're training large models uh, with shared data. Think of something like federated learning. And one premise in such a system is that the sensitive information in the training data that we provide is not supposed to be revealed to anyone who has only access to the trained model. But as these trained models get larger and larger, it gets easier and easier to launch such membership inference attacks. So take an example of GPT-2, which is a large uh, language model trained on public data. Um, people figured out that if you plug in this particular keyword to this trained neural network, then it, st it starts to spit out this sensitive information about someone who was obviously in the training data. So this is a serious breach of privacy and the best chance we have to protect against such membership in person attacks is uh, differential privacy or more specifically differentially private stochastic gradient descent and what it does is that when training such a large model in your batch gradient update instead of using the batch gradient it's gonna take the gradients from your mini batch and do a differentially private mean estimation which I will explain in detail in a little bit and run a, a training of this gradient descent. But one thing I want you to remember at this point is that the best chance we have protecting our membership in first attacks is through using differentially private mean estimator, which takes the average of a bunch of gradient vectors in a differentially private way. So mean estimation is critical. Another thing that can go wrong when you're training on a shared data is that you cannot trust everyone or every client who's giving you this data. 
So what can happen is that there can be a user who injects a poison data where an image is poisoned by corrupting, let's say, a few pixels like these ones here. And then the label is changed to, in this case, a deer. If you train on a corrupted data like this, what's gonna happen is that the train model will be corrupted. And at prediction time, whatever the background image is, if you have similar looking triggers, pixels changed, then the prediction will be changed to a deer. So a backdoor has been created in this train model. And this is a serious issue. And the strongest defense we have currently uses uh, what's called robust estimation or robust statistics. And the main idea there is that if a corrupted model has a backdoor, then there should be a path or subset of neurons which are activated when it sees such a trigger like this one here. So to test this, we ran some experiments. We trained the ResNet 18 on CIFAR 10 data set that's been corrupted. And I'm cutting it somewhere in the middle, which has 5,000 neurons. So every data point passed through this trained corrupted neural network will have a 5,000 dimensional representation. And I'm looking at only those that have labeled deer, which is the one that's the target um, label. And the blue ones are the clean and the orange ones are the poison ones. And to be able to show you this 5,000 dimensional representations, I'm projecting all this down to top six PCA directions such that the um, off diagonals show you scatter plot of the blues and oranges in these two dimensions out of the six for each two. And on the diagonals, I have a histogram of these two blue and orange data points projected down to each of these one dimensions of each of the six. And the point here is that if I don't tell you which one is blue and which one is orange, it's going to be tricky for you to figure it out because it's pretty mixed up. So I did another experiment where I took the mean and the covariance, 5,000 dimensional, of the blue points only, the clean ones, and then I whitened all of these data representations, meaning I subtracted the mean and multiplied it by sigma negative half, or sigma is the, uh, the um, covariance of the clean data points. If you do that, what's going to happen is that all the blue points are now white, and so it's nicely round and circle, whichever direction you look at. These ones are squished a little bit only because the uh, scaling of the y and x axis are different, but they think of them as circle. And orange ones are now going to shoot out in a direction which is exactly captured by the top PCA directions. But here I cheated a little because I was using the mean and the covariance of the blue points, which I was using the information which one's blue, but I don't have to because if I use robust mean and covariance estimator that I can use off the shelf and just apply to this problem, immediately I get a mean and covariance of a subset of data points which concentrates the best. That's what robust estimators are supposed to do. And using it, I get exactly the same performance. And after this whitening, I can use any outlier detection and cut them off and easily detect the orange points. And I can remove them, filter them out, retrain, and get a, a good uh, clean train model, which we call Spectre, this whole framework. So we tried this on all the backdoor attacks, state of the art, we could find the codes online or those that we can implement ourselves. And from all of them, the performance looks like this. Without defense, as you increase the number of corrupted examples, the success rate of the poisoning attack is gonna increase, obviously. But at any operating point, if you use our idea to filter out the poison data set and retrain on the filtered data, you get perfectly clean model with no backdoor at all. So if you're interested in this part of the research, my research, which is just the motivation for my today's talk, but which is nevertheless as important as research direction for me, please visit our website, which gives you all different kinds of mixes of attacks and defenses. You can mix and match them and try out them uh, yourself. But the one thing you want, I want you to remember here at this point, for the talk is that, again, the best defense we have against such complex backdoor attacks is robust mean and covariance estimation.
So in practice, any attack can be launched They're easy. So we need to defend against both inference attacks and also backdoor attacks, but there's no single algorithm that can guarantee protection against both. So the goal of the first part of my talk is to present our efficient algorithm that probably guarantees robustness and privacy. And if you have any questions so far, this is a good place to take a pause. Uh, isn't the uh, differential privacy uh, also used for uh, a training stage in general? Uh, right. So for this talk, I'm only going to focus on simple questions where there's no training. I'm going to only talk about mean estimation. And also, it works for other estimations. But those can be used inside of a training so that potentially could be used for training uh, a deep neural network, which we haven't done yet. But that's okay. the motivation. But the building block is, as I said, mean estimation and covariance estimation. If you can do that in a differential private way and robustly, then you are kind of guaranteed to protect against this kind of attacks. Okay. Great. Right. Great. It's a, yeah. So that's a perfect segue to my point, which is that in this talk, I'm going to focus on statistical estimation problems where there is a distribution P of a parameter theta that we don't know. And we get IID samples, N of them, we want to estimate theta. And in robust estimation, we have an adversary who's going to corrupt an arbitrary alpha fraction of the data points and replace them with arbitrary data points. And knowing that it has such an attack has happened, we want a robust estimate of theta. And in differential privacy, we have another adversary who is inspecting our output data head and try to see if X, let's say particular data point X3 is in the training data or not. And in this talk, we're gonna focus on mean estimation problem. And the question we're asking is how much more do you have to pay in terms of the error of this estimate if you're asking for robustness or privacy, which are the questions that people before me have asked and answered. And where I come in is what happens if you want a robustness and privacy both. But I'm gonna walk you slowly through all of these progresses. So mean estimation, you want to estimate the mean mu from IID samples. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to assume that the data is coming from sub-Gaussian with identity covariance matrix. And the error uh, metric that I'm going to use is going to be minimax error. In this mean estimation, which is square root of d over n, d is the dimension of the data and is the number of samples you have. And I'm not going to care about any constants or any log terms. So I'll be very, very informal about constants and logs. Right, for robust mean estimation, we have an adversary corrupting alpha fraction of this data set. And there has been tremendous progress recently um, on this robust mean estimation. I will just touch or emphasize one paper, which is by Dong, Hopkins, and Lee in 2019, which is the fastest algorithm that gets you optimal error rate for robust mean estimation. Because uh, what well, a fast algorithm means is that it touches the data less. So the privacy leakage is less, so it's much easier to make those algorithms private. And I'll touch on this later when I come back to this. But if you look at robust mean estimation, it's quite easy to do in low dimensions because if you think about, let's say, one-dimensional sub-Gaussian samples, which is plotted as a histogram like this, then all the adversary can do if she wants to move the mean, let's say to the right, is take some points on the left and move them to the right. And if you move too much to the right, you'll be detected as an outlier. For, so a simple outlier detection algorithm, for example, like which cuts off the top alpha fraction and then the bottom left alpha fraction, it's going to give you the optimal um, robust error under such corruption, which achieves error of uh, order alpha because I'm not going to care too much about the log terms. But in high dimensions, it gets tricky because each data point can look perfectly normal like this, but they can collude together so that they're moving this mean to, for example, of the order of alpha times 
product of D, where D is the dimension, which can be huge. So this is a scatter plot of the data samples that I have of us, let's say, Gaussian or sub Gaussian distribution. So it's a high dimensional sphere, which I'm plotting in this two dimensions. So you should imagine a hypersphere in high dimensions when I write it like this. But notice that if such an attack has been launched, they have to collude together so that they have to make a significant change to the covariance of this data points also. And what that means is precisely is captured in this geometric lemma, which tells you that if an adversary moves the empirical mean a lot, that it must be so that the covariance has to increase a lot also. And this insight started this line of exciting research in efficient algorithms called filtering for robust mean estimation, which goes as follows. Every iteration, you're going to check the covariance. And if it's larger than some threshold, then you will take the top PCA direction of the data points you have right now and project all the data points down to that one dimension and filter out data points that correspond or contribute more to the variance in that one direction. Yeah. And if you choose this one dimensional filter carefully, then you can ensure that every time you will be guaranteed to remove at least one data point so that this algorithm will terminate. And also um, you will be guaranteed that the, every iteration you'll be removing more corrupted data points than clean ones. So the algorithm will compute the PCA and try to remove data points that have large variance in this direction. So maybe this one will move, removed. And with the remaining ones, you do PCA again, which will point to other direction and try to remove points that have large variance, which will remove some good points and some bad points, but on average, it works, uh, removes more bad points. So then when it stops, you're guaranteed that the extra that's incurred because of this alpha corruption in the data set and because you're doing the robust estimation, you pay more uh, a cost of error alpha more in the, um, in the mean estimation error. And you can show that this is minimus optimal because there's a matching lower bound telling us that even if you have infinite number of samples so that you know the PDF exactly, there'll be two Gaussian distributions in one dimension of variance one, which is only alpha apart. And the total variation distance will be order alpha, meaning that an adversary can move alpha fraction of the probability mass and switch from one uh, Gaussian to the other. So when we get this samples from this diffusion or the distribution itself, we cannot tell which one was the original one. So the extra cost we pay for having alpha fraction you know, corrupted, if you use the right algorithm, is alpha. And now let's look at what we can do if we are asking for differential privacy. So differential privacy ensures that um, even the strongest adversary who knows every other data points in the data set except for my data, data entry cannot tell whether I'm participating in the data set or not. And that gives me um, plausible deniability. Precisely what it does is that think of two databases, S and S prime, that only differ in one entry, let's say that's my entry. Then a randomized output of a query is called satisfies epsilon delta differential privacy if it satisfies the following um, conditions. And what it means is that the probability, the output of the query is in particular set A, when it was queried on the data set S is similar to probability of a query output is in the same set when we query on a different data set S prime that only differs in one entry. So for small epsilon and delta close to zero, that means that these two probabilities are similar. So an adversary looking at the output of the query cannot tell whether it came from a data set S or S prime. So the testing fails. So the inference attack fails and we get plausible deniability. 
So how do we design a mechanism that satisfies such a difference of privacy? Is that like an example of mean estimation on binary data where data is zero or one. The true mean will be somewhere in a number line between zero and one like this. And the important concept is called sensitivity, which is how much can you shift the true statistic by changing only one entry, for example, from zero to one. So in this case, it's obviously, obviously one over n is how much you can shift the mean. So sensitivity is one over n. And once you have the sensitivity of whatever the query you are asking, then there's a straightforward way of constructing a differential private mechanism by adding a Gaussian noise to the output, where the noise is proportional to the sensitivity over epsilon, the privacy level. So for smaller epsilon or the larger sensitivity, the PDF is going to get wider and wider. So that's a sufficiently overlap to the probability or the uh, differential privacy condition is satisfied. And the extra error you pay for this adding Gaussian noise will be about the standard deviation, which is sensitivity over epsilon, which in this example is one over n epsilon. But in the problems that we want to solve, which is high dimensional mean estimation from arbitrary sub Gaussian distribution, the support is not bounded and we don't know where this distribution of those sample points are. So what people propose is that we run private histogram on each of the coordinates so that we find two bins that are consecutive and has most of the uh, points or has highest occurrences and construct the, construct the bounding box or hypercube that includes the most of the points and project all the points into inside of this bounding hypercube. So once you project, then the most you can shift a data point is of order square root of d because each side has order one uh, you know, length. So the sensitivity of a mean in this hypercube is going to be square root d over n. That's how much one data point can change the mean. So given this, it's straightforward to construct the differential private mean estimator by adding Gaussian noise according to the sensitivity of epsilon. And it's coordinate, you're paying the error of sensitivity over epsilon. And there are D coordinates. So in L2 error, you pay this times square root of D. And in this case, it's gonna be D over an epsilon. And this can be made precise that so that you guarantee an error bound of D over epsilon n. And this is also optimal because you can prove a matching lower bound, which I won't go into details. Any questions so far? Uh, would you um, maybe explain a little bit more, maybe for beginners, uh, what's the... Uh... Uh, relationship between this epsilon delta differential privacy, uh, which I uh, recall uh, uh, has its own definition and uh, right. is how it's related to this, uh, um, you know, robust mean estimation. Is it? Uh, right. Yes. So, um, so this one is saying, if you have corruption, you have to pay this much. This one is saying, if you want differential privacy, you have to pay this much more in the error. The error is increased by this much. And when you want both, I will explain what our approach is and what you get in a bit. So right now the robustness and differential privacy are separate. I haven't combined them yet is one thing. And in terms of understanding this epsilon is that Epsilon and delta uh, measures how much privacy you want. And smaller epsilon means more privacy. You have to add larger noise. And how much larger is the key. And in, terms, in, in this example of mean estimation, it's telling us that the, how much more noise you're adding or how much error you're incurring because of the noise is uh, scaling like d over epsilon n, which is optimal. If you use suboptimal algorithms, this may be d squared over epsilon n or d over epsilon squared of n. And people have tried, you know, hard to come up with this optimal algorithm. Okay. Thank okay. <laughs> All right. So let's. Uh, uh, one, one second, one quick announcement. Uh, for the audience, if you have any questions, you can 
uh, ask yours on the chat board. Uh, the uh, speaker will read it and uh, uh, give you immediate feedback. Yep, Thank you. that's fine too. If you prefer writing, that's fine. <laughs> if you wanna stop me and ask, that's fine too. Yeah, sometimes Korean students are kind of shy to ask, but uh, so am I. So it's are... mutual. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> there are uh, more, uh, more uh, like outgoing on chat board. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take chat board questions. So feel free to write anything. All right. So now we want to introduce our approach, which is I want to take the filtering algorithm and turn it into a differential private one. So we take a filtering algorithm like this one, which I explained before. And there are two main challenges we have to overcome. The first one is that in the worst case, this kind of um, filtering algorithm can run for order D iterations. And that's really large because every time you access the data, you're leaking something about the data. So privacy gets worse and worse. So this is gonna be a problem when you turn it into a private algorithm. And the reason this happens is that, excuse me, in the worst case, um, the adversary can place this corrupted data point, which she can place anywhere, uh, spread out in D different orthogonal directions so that our algorithm, which looks at only one direction at a time, can um, delete or filter out only one data, corrupted data point at a time. So it has to look at all the D directions. So to avoid this, the recent work of Don Hawkins and Lee called quantum robust mean estimation came up with a brilliant idea where every iteration it looks at all the directions captured by D by D matrix V, but each direction is um, weighted according to how much covariance is in that direction by this matrix exponential. And then using this V, we compute a quantum score for each data point, projecting it down to one dimensions and filter out those that have large uh, quantum scores. And to get a feel for what this means, if this beta here uh, coefficient was infinity, then this returns the top PCA direction and this uh, returns exactly the one PCA algorithm that we were doing before. So be slow. Um, if beta is equal to zero, it means that this whole thing would be zero. So you're equally weighting all the directions. So you're treating all the extreme equally and you're trying to filter out those that have large uh, norm distance, if you will. But for appropriate beta between these two, you can prove that uh, the iteration complexity reduces from order D iterations to um, log D squared, which is dramatic improvement. And there's a beautiful connection to regression analysis of online you know, matrix multiple weight algorithms, which I won't go into details, but those of you who are interested should uh, definitely read. So with this, we get the number of iterations down to log D squared. Uh, the second challenge in making this algorithm private is that the one dimensional filters that people use are highly sensitive in a differential private sense meaning that in the original algorithm, each sample we wanna filter out according to their um, quantum score. So if you sort them according to quantum score, there'll be these you know, samples. And what is proposed is that each sample will flip its own coin with a bias proportional to each quantum score and decide whether it will be uh, filtered out or not. And the resulting filtered cell will be looking something like this. But the, this is fine if you want robustness, but the problem with this, if you want uh, privacy, is that for privacy, we need to simulate the process for another data set S prime, which is only one data point different. So think about having one more data point with quantum score, you know, anything's fine. But the problem is that because of privacy, we're not supposed to know the identity of these data points. So we cannot couple the coin flips that this coin used or this data point used with this data point. So we might as well use independent coin flips where the resulting output of this coin flip or the filtering is gonna be complete, completely independent and different. So the sensitivity blows up at the one filtering. So to handle this, we propose a different way of filtering that uses a single filter or threshold Z 
that's drawn uniformly between zero and a particularly chosen threshold row. And there's a lot of kind of technical innovation that goes into how we compute this row in a differential variable way, which I won't go into details. But once you choose this Z, then the filter can just operate so that we filter everything above the C. And what's nice is that this filter can now be uh, coupled throughout different data sets because Z has nothing to do with the data points. It's not revealing any privacy. And if you couple, then you can show that if the original data SNS prime differed in only one data point, then um, let's say this one and this one. So this one was moved to this one in the original data point. Then after filtering and most, the difference should be only one data point, which is, if you look at it like this, it's obvious, but it's critical in preserving differential privacy through many iterations of such filtering processes. And with this, we call our algorithm prime for private and robust mean estimation. So first, do you run some private histogram like you did for DP mean to get some bounding box? And inside the bounding box, you run the quantum robust mean estimation with privatization. For in, the, in each step, the mean and the covariance will be privatized or made differentially private by adding Gaussian noise of appropriate variances. And then there's this you know, complex mechanism that finds differential differential row, which I won't go into details. And you draw a uniform you know, random variable and do the one dimensional filtering as I explained. And this algorithm is efficient and guaranteed to achieve a error guarantee that the now robust and differentially private mean estimator, even if there's alpha corruption, is going to be at most from the true mean away square root of d over n plus alpha plus d to the 1.5 over epsilon n error in Euclidean norm. So the alpha is what we pay for the robustness or corruption is the same, remains optimal, but the privacy cost that we pay is now has a gap of square root of d compared to a lower bound that was uh, for just a differential variable mean estimation. And to understand where this gap comes from, the bottom like this sample complexity is the quantum scoring step where the best known algorithm is adding IID Gaussian noise matrix W to the covariance matrix of, in this case, uh, where the variance is D over epsilon n. And the spectral norm of such Gaussian matrix, you can easily show that is over D to the 1.5 over epsilon n. And the spectral norm error you incurred because of the privacy carries over throughout the algorithm, causing this the same uh, error in the mean estimation. And currently it's not known you can do this process. This is just a, like a covariance estimation, which is a simple problem for you know, very specific data set. Uh, DP, differential private covariance estimation, it's not known if you can do any better than this. And in general, you cannot do it any better because there's a matching lower bound, but for this specific problem, it still uh, you know, remains an open question. So while thinking about this gap of square root of D factor, if we can improve it, if it's fundamental, how do we uh, you know, resolve it? We took a different road, route of uh, proposing a algorithm that takes exponential time that's inefficient, but closes the gap. And that's a segue to the second part of my talk, which, you know, if anyone has any question, this will be a good time to take a pause. Uh, so one minor question there, um, is there any um, um, uh, dependency uh, on the um, data covariance? I think is it uh, you know the right. right in terms of the um, the algorithm performance? Right, uh, good question. So for the ones that I'm explaining in this talk, I'm assuming the covariance is identity. Mm -hmm. If you don't that, know the covariance, uh, 
Is that kind of in the worst case or the best case? The identity. It is the best case. Best case. It is the best case. The condition number is one. Usually, if the condition number of the covariance is large, you lose something. So if you don't know the covariance and have to do all this, there's two ways to do it. You use inefficient algorithm that we propose, and that one will work for any covariance and adapt to it. If you want an efficient algorithm, you have to estimate the covariance also in a robust and differentiated way, which we also have an algorithm for, just that the sample complexity or the error will increase. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I've been so at this point, I've been thinking after this paper that I wrote, that we've been thinking about how to do robustness and privacy and how they are they fundamentally related. Because if you think about differential private estimation, then what it's saying is that the estimate should not change too much when you change one entry in the data set. If you look at what robust estimation is trying to do, say, it's telling you that the um, estimate should not change too much when you change the alpha fraction of the data set. So in some sense, they're solving the same problem, it's just that how exactly you measure privacy or robustness is different. And that kind of thought process after a long time, um, you know, the end product is what we call high dimensional proposed test release. This is a general algorithm or framework that can use for any statistical estimation problem to give you a differentially private um, statistical estimate. It's computationally inefficient. You're not supposed to implement it. Um, but because we're using robust statistic, statistics to build this differential parallel algorithm, as a byproduct, you get robustness for free using this approach. And this can be used for many different uh, estimation problems, including mean estimation, covariance estimation, linear regression, principal component analysis. And in many of those cases, you get optimal sample complexity for uh, you know immediately. Meaning that this is the best algorithmic approach, although not compute computational, to identify or characterize the sample complexity of any of those problems that you're interested in. And I think the best way to kind of show you that it's natural and fundamental is just to tell you what the algorithm is. So let's take one problem instance. This is slightly more complex because it's mean estimation and the, again, sub Gaussian samples, but the covariance is sigma and we don't know it. We do not know it. And the error metric is also more stronger in the sense that instead of you could know, we're gonna use what's called the Mahalanovis error distance which is you know, scaled by sigma negative half. And this is the right method because this gives you uh, equal variance on all the directions of the error. And for this, what is known is that if you want an efficient differentially private mean estimation algorithm, then you need some bound on the sigma and you have to know the bound and you need d to the 1.5 uh, you know, samples to get some error rate. The error rate itself is optimal, but there's a bunch of assumptions and a bunch of you know, conditions. But if you allow exponential time, then there's recent work that shows that you can achieve nearly optimal error rate, but there's an extra one of epsilon factors. It's a larger um, because epsilon, we're thinking is something small uh, from the lower bound. But what we can do immediately is the following. This is our approach. And I'll show you how you, uh, you, know, you design the algorithm. You take the uh, population loss that you want to minimize. This is what you want to minimize within your head. And you turn it into a different form where it's maximization of all directions V and the inner product instead of the null. So this store exactly the equivalent form, just written in a different way. And then I do something highly non-trivial, which is critical for our purpose, which is you turn this loss into another one that only involves one-dimensional statistics. So this one in the uh, numerator is a one-dimensional mean, and this one is a one-dimensional covariance. So it will be you know, one-dimensional standard deviation. This is exactly mathematically the same thing, just written in a different way, but it's critical you write it in this way, and you'll see why in a bit. And once you have this formulation of the, uh, the population loss you want to minimize, 
we, when we have samples, we want to you know, minimize the empirical loss defined as, again, replacing all these statistics by the empirical one, but we use the robust one. Robust one-dimensional mean, robust one-dimensional variance. I'll explain how exactly how it's defined in a bit. But now we have a well-defined loss we want to minimize, but we want to be differentially private. So instead of minimizing this loss, you stochastically minimize it by sampling from an exponential distribution which goes down with this loss. So you're likely to sample from with that has smaller loss. And it's scaled by epsilon over delta, which is a sensitivity of this loss you just defined. And if delta is indeed a sensitivity, then it follows that this mechanism of sampling satisfies epsilon zero differential privacy. Okay? And the critical part here is that the sensitivity of this loss we just defined here it is, dramatically smaller if we use one-dimensional robust statistics like this, as opposed to using some high-dimensional definitions. Uh, one quick, quick question there. Um, the reason why you do the um, sampling of mu there, is, is it, uh, are you trying so, to hide that the, the fact that there's a one element being changed in differential privacy? So I haven't, yeah, right. I haven't touched that yet. So at this point, there's nothing differential private about this loss itself. Mm -hmm. You could say that I'm gonna minimize this function over mu hat, and that's gonna be a good, you know, mean estimator. That's robust. That's fine too. Mm -hmm. This I'm just defining it in this way. But once you have a per, some you know, loss, empirical loss defined in some way, you can plug it in here in an exponential you know, mechanism, you know what it's called, exponential distribution that you're sampling mu hat from. And that sampled mu hat sampled in this way will be uh, differentially private. So this sampling is which uh, gives you differential privacy. Doesn't okay. matter what this loss was. Whatever loss was, if you put the corresponding sensitivity delta in there, it will be differentially private. And the name of the game is that which loss should you use so that the sensitivity is smaller? Because smaller sensitivity leads to better uh, accuracy or smaller error. So the whole game is, there's nothing new in this formulation here, but everything new is in this formulation of the loss that we proposed as opposed to some other things that people used or people can propose, this one has dramatically smaller sensitivity delta, which immediately translate into smaller delta here means that this PDF is much concentrated. So it's sampling much smaller, closer to the true mean. So your error is gonna be smaller. Okay, uh, there's uh, one question uh, from the chat board. If you, if you don't mind, you can. Sure, I can read it. Uh, one question. Seems <laughs> that uh, quantum robust mean estimation is related to softmax or energy-based models. S uh, smoothing of argmax makes robustness. Right, so you get robustness whether you use the quantum score or just use the PCA, you get the same robustness. Quantum makes it faster. So it looks like softmax or energy-based model, but that's not the motivation. The motivation will be rather what's called multi, uh, matrix multiplicative weights, which is a particular online optimization algorithm for specific you know, linear loss. There, there you get something that looks like the quantum score, again, that, which looks like an energy-based model. And that one uh, gives you the smaller number of iterations. And D is the, oh, okay. So that inefficient is not about samples. So that there was a, one, one thing I think I need to clarify. Sorry about that. So D is the better sample or error rate. Inefficient, I should write it longer. Inefficient uh, corresponds to the uh, running time of the algorithm. So with the inefficient algorithm, you get better sample complexity or better error rate. With SVD time algorithm, where the running time is corresponding to running one SVD of the algorithm, you get worse error. 
thank you for the question and clarification. So inefficient means the computation. This is the you know, sample or error complexity. Good, good questions, thank you. All right, so this is where I was, I was here. Uh, and the key ingredient in analyzing you know, this proposed exponential mechanism or showing that this particular one has small sensitivity is resilience. And I'm gonna just show you that the sample one-dimensional robust mean, which is, I'm gonna define in a bit, has small sensitivity. And that's, I think, the gist of why the whole thing works. So I'm gonna, in one dimension, so I'm gonna project all the uh, samples. You will get some histogram like this, and there might be some corrupted data points. I define a robust mean in this one dimension as the following. I cut off two alpha top tail and bottom two alpha tail. And remaining in the middle part, I'm gonna take the average and call that my robust mean. And I'm gonna prove that this particular robust mean in one dimension has very small sensitivity. The scales as sigma v is the variance along this direction. So just how those things are scales, so there's nothing you can do about it. And this is some log factor over n, which is as small as it gets. Okay. And then how I show this as small sensitivity is through resilience. So resilience has to do with the tail of this distribution. In this case, sub-Gaussian. So sub-Gaussian distributions, one can show that this top part I removed has average of this top part is at most sigma v times some log factor away from the true mean. And also for the bottom part. So the average of the top part and bottom part are not too far from the true mean, which means is that there's one point at least at the bottom part and one point at least on the top part. And between these two critical points, they are not that far away and most order sigma v times some log factor. So these are the points that I did not include in when I was taking the robust mean. So they're giving me effective boundary of this robust mean so that the support, how much one can change my this robust mean process is this much. So the sensitivity is that thing divided by n, which is very, very small compared to other things you could have done in high dimensions. And that's why resilience, which is a critical notion used in robust statistics, comes to save us in this one dimensional sensitivity of this one dimensional robust mean. And putting this together, um, this is our algorithm. One caveat is that in doing this, the sensitivity bound that I just showed you only holds if the data is coming IID from sub and distribution, which means that if any other data point data set is thrown at this algorithm, it won't be differentially private. So to handle this, uh, people use what's called proposed test release, which operates in the following way. In the first step, you propose a sensitivity that you're gonna use in your exponential mechanism, which only depends on, in our formulation, on the tail of the distribution, the fact that it's sub-Gaussian, and also the number of sample points. And, and then in the second step, you test if your given data set S is uh, differentially private with respect to this you know, sensitivity. And if only if it passes this test, you run this exponential mechanism and release an output. Otherwise, you don't do anything, you output nothing. And this guarantees that this will only uh, proceed when the data set is good. In putting all this together, this is our high dimensional proposed test release framework. And it can be applied to any statistical estimation problem because there's nothing specific to mean estimation in what I just explained. You can do the same thing for linear regression, covariance estimation, principal component analysis, and get the similar, similar sensitivity and similar guarantees. And the analysis is also generic. You can apply the same technique to all these problems, ensure that we achieve, we're in, I think most of these cases, we're the first algorithm to achieve um, optimal error rate with almost no assumptions at all. 
And in other cases, we achieve the best performance. It's just that we don't have the matching lower bounds yet. So this is a very generic framework. And as the byproduct, one consequence is that we get the lower bound for the original problem with identity, identity covariance. We get the, uh, you know, with the exponential time algorithm, we get the optimal sample complexity, closing the square root of gap, which means that if you only care about, about statistical cost and can spare any running time, there's no uh, you know, extra cost in requiring both uh, robustness to corruption and differential privacy. You get a sample complexity, that's the sum of these two. But if you want it fast, then you do have to pay extra factor of score root of fee. And uh, we think this is just opening the door for many, many you know, research directions to be done. For example, how can you efficiently do you know, mean estimation with different, you know, assumptions, principal component analysis, uh, linear regression or convex optimization, guaranteeing both privacy and uh, robustness, because that in practice, that is gonna be required. And also in different settings where privacy can be de uh, defined at the user level where user has multiple data points and robustness can be also defined at the user level where each client user can give you multiple corrupted data points. So when user level privacy and robustness go together, you know, what can we do? And for other domains like discrete distributions or you know, graphs, how can we do this kind of things? It's widely open and I think there's a many interesting questions to be solved with also a, a huge practical impact, which is what we're working on towards right now to implement all of this in you know federated setting and come up with nice algorithms. So in conclusion, um, in we're studying statistical estimation problems uh, that give you privacy and robustness together, and we're the first ones to do it. And if you want an efficient algorithm, there's extra cost you pay in the error or sample complexity. But if you're okay with slow exponential time algorithms, then there's no statistical cost. You get uh, you get uh, a matching upper bound as the lower bound, you get the optimal algorithm. And this talk was based on, you know, three papers. Um, robust and differential private mean estimation was the first part of my talk. The second part, which is a working paper, which we plan on putting on archive in a couple of weeks, is differential privacy and robust statistics in high dimensions. And at the beginning, I give you a spectral algorithm for doing defense against backdoor attacks, which is another paper, recent paper that we have put on archive, which was presented at ICNL. So with this, I think it's a good time to stop. And I'd be happy to take any questions regarding any parts of my talk. And I'm always looking for amazing undergraduates who wants to do PhD, um, especially from Korea. I always look at all the Korean applicants. So please shoot me an email if you're applying, thinking about doing a PhD in the US. Uh, and please, I encourage you to apply. So yeah, now I open the floor for questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, maybe for the undergrad, what kind of uh, like uh, backgrounds or technical uh, like- Oh yeah, good question. Do you really prefer? <laughs> you know, thank you. That, you know. I'm, I'm looking for someone who's ambitious, who want to write okay. amazing research papers. Um, I do research- do they have to be uh, mathematically talented or no? Right, so I do research in both. Some of them are purely, you know, theoretical, like this one I'm writing, and some of them are purely applied, like this one is not even a single equation in the paper. So I do research in both directions as long as it's exciting. Um, and usually I look for people who have both backgrounds, some theoretical background that can, you know, if time comes, can do some theoretical weightlifting, but also, you know, a lot of uh, maybe hands-on background on, you know, deep learning, computer vision, NLP, I do both. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, any background that you have is a good background for me. 
okay. applied or theoretical. Okay. But I do look for someone who's taken theoretical courses at least. Maybe not theoretical research, but you know, theoretical courses give you a lot of you know muscles to do research, even if you don't do theory research. So I prefer people who take in theory courses, preferably maybe even uh, graduate level courses. Okay, going back to the technical question, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, it can be any, any general questions about uh, latest other research topic or maybe detailed technical question. Any questions from the audience? 질문을 어, 챗보드에 하셔도 됩니다. Uh, maybe while we are waiting, I have a one, uh, one or two general and detailed question. Uh, first one is, uh, you showed this, uh, uh, this the optimality in terms of uh, in terms of uh, you know error rate, mm -hmm. uh, but the, you have to suffer this exponential uh, time complexity. Is there any like uh, maybe a clue or maybe direction that you're taking to maybe improve this uh, time? Right. Yeah, I think that's a very fundamental question. I believe, okay, we've done this for mean estimation, covariance estimation, similar gap happens. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's gonna happen for anything we apply, linear regression, PCA. Once we do it, there'll be a gap. Um, it's an open question. Uh, there's no matching lower bound because the lower bound will require computational lower bound telling us that no efficient algorithm can do this. Lower bound for the- uh, yeah, Differential private, right, okay. for the error rate. So uh, ideal theoretical result will be a lower bound telling you that with efficient time algorithm and also differential privacy, D to the 1.5 over epsilon n is necessary. Okay. But there's no technique to do that yet. There's no technique for computational lower bound and differential private lower bound. Separately, there are, but no one, I don't think, has done it together. And it's kind of an open question if there is a, such a lower bound. But if I had to bet my money, I would bet that this is fundamental, that there exists a lower bound, that, but it's hard to prove. Uh, okay. Very good. Um, I, maybe. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, I have one kind of very general question. Uh, you uh, mentioned that you part of your research topics is federated learning. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you, you know, think that you can just combine these two slightly different research topics? federated learning and differential privacy. Is there maybe a progress that you are making now? Right, so federated learning oh, oh, means two things. One is federated learning and federated analysis. Mm -hmm. So federated analysis does simple questions like mean estimation, but in a federated setting, yeah. using secure aggregation with differential privacy. So that problem will be federated analysis where the tools we uh, build can be readily applied as long as it can be compatible with what cryptographically people use called a uh, secure aggregation. So that we are working on right now. Mm -hmm. But federated learning is training, has to solve convex or non-convex optimization. That's a different beast. To do that, there are like, three steps in between. We have to be able to do it centrally for convex optimization, and then do it through secure aggregation and do it for non-convex. So we're slowly making the progress, uh, but this, that will be you know, maybe some few years away from now. Okay. Okay, I understand. Any, any questions from the students or the audience? <laughs> <laughs> People are shy. Especially yeah, if you're interested, please read our paper, visit our website uh, for the code, play with it, and just email me. I'm happy to answer you know, any of your emails uh, afterwards. Actually, a lot of students here are uh, like studying uh, 
deep learning uh, as, as their uh, kind of a main interest. Mm -hmm. um, do you, how do you, I mean, if, if you want to really apply to practice, how, how do you uh, apply your algorithm to deep learning scenario? Is right. Um, I have other data set or uh, go ahead. Right. So, for example, my uh, original the, the motivation on Spectre, which does robustness in deep learning training, is fully applied deep learning, you know, project. Mm -hmm. One thing they come together is I'm trying to do this in a differentially private way. So that's one way where they can come together. Can you do the Spectre algorithm? also privately and that mm. requires the tools that i developed and that's something we're doing right now so that's how you know uh, immediately it connects to deep learning to give you a uh, protection against backdoor attacks for deep learning but also mm. privacy for the data mm -hmm. okay. in that way it's deep learning um, mm. but i have many other projects that are not directly related to privacy that are deep learning projects like like this one Mm, and privacy and deep learning, people are looking into how to give you private models through deep learning. That's one thing that I myself have not delved into too much yet. Okay. Uh, there's one uh, short question on the chat board. Mm -hmm. You might want to read. Yes, uh, you are correct. And I omitted every O, o tilde constant and log and all of them. For the slides in the paper we do it correctly <laughs> so the slides there were too much for the audience so i just removed all those so they're all like wiggly or, or all approximate and uh what was kind of i i'm kind of trying to uh uh get an intuitive feel for your uh your your work uh what was kind of initial motivation to consider the, uh, the corruption uh, issue? I mean, right. I know a lot of people are thinking about differential privacy lately, but corruption issue is not that as popular as that. Well, was there a motivation for you to consider that? Right. So I was looking at just robust statistics, like how to do robust mean and how to do robust covariance. And there's been tremendous theoretical advances recently but those are by you know, theoretical CS people who don't care about the you know, actual mm -hmm. application. And one thing that struck me kind of odd is that these are amazing tools and no one's using it because people who are building it are completely theoretical. People who are applied has never heard about it. And I was in the right position okay. that I know enough applied research, enough theory that I could do both. So this specter is like, I think one of the best practical things that came out of robust statistics, which is very theoretical research topic. Okay, that's great. And that kind of started me thinking about how to use these tools practically. And that was where the, all this came out. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Oh, unless there's any, any other questions, maybe we can, close up the session. A any questions from the audience before we finish? Okay, so let us then thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor O for your uh, inspiring talk. I think there are a lot of things even for me to learn here. Um, so, but it's quite interesting topic. Uh, so maybe I'll uh, yeah, read All some right. of the papers and hope you can get uh, maybe good responses from uh, some students here or by email. Um, so before we go, any ending comments from you? <laughs> uh, me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's great meeting you all. Uh, you know, I was hoping I would see your faces at least on Zoom, but you know, it's uh, hard to ask people to. Yeah. yeah. Hope you can meet, uh, you know, face to face, you know, sooner or later. Because yeah, uh, at some point I'll visit SNU and ask Jungwoo to you know gather all of you again and talk to you in person. So thanks a lot and yeah, see you. What was your time. have fun? I guess you graduated what year? Uh, 2002. 2002. I think it was before your time. I think before you started. I uh, think at SNU. 
Okay, yeah, okay. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for your excellent talk and I'll see, uh, see you soon. Okay, All right. thanks. Thanks, bye. Bye.